thinking that, okay, it's, you know, it's not evolving fast enough. Microsoft's doing a spectacular job with what they're evolving with D3D, but along came mobile and now WebGL, and all of a sudden OpenGL is what's, you know, is probably rendering 10 times as many triangles as, I, you know, as anything else. And it's, you know, it's far from a perfect API. Uh, all of the, the implicit state in bindings is still you know, a huge wart. We still want lower level access to you know, directly using buffers and, uh, and some of the other things, treating it like a CPU. But it's still a good thing. And I, I can give myself a, a little bit of a, a pat on the back for all the, the work that I, I did to kind of help make that happen over the years. And I think that uh, the industry as a whole is still is definitely better off for that. And again, it's, it's not bad to have Microsoft doing a great job with all the D3D stuff, uh, but it's good to have a couple competing paradigms and something that was, you know, that wound up being free for the platforms that are going in thousands and thousands of different things. So that's been a good thing. Uh, on the rendering side of things, uh, physically correct lighting, it's wonderful to see that that's all the rage now. It's all anybody's talking about for the next gen stuff. And it's, you know, it's good. It will win. It will be better. We've seen this, you know, we've seen this story before with the offline rendering crowd about being resistant at first and finding out that it actually does make their lives easier. I, uh, I made a push for this several years ago and did not get enough internal traction with, uh, you know, with the art team to to kind of buy into it because it requires changing things, looking at it a different way, giving up your favorite tweaks and hacks and the ways that you know how to sort of beat the current rendering equation into submission. But, uh, you know, we've had, we're in a situation where we've got a lot more buy-in now. It's got public mind share. Uh, it's, it's going to be the way things are going. We're, we'll always be approximating it to some degree, but trying to have somewhat plausibly rational albedos and having things that make a little bit of sense is just a good thing. And in the end, it'll be easier to make content that works well. So my, uh, my big software evolution over the last certainly three years and stretching back tendrils a little bit further than that has been this move towards functional programming style and pure functions. And it's, long enough, it's been long enough now that I can really take some valid data points from it where I can look at some code. I just ran across this uh, last week. I was looking through some code, and I came across this file full of a bunch of reasonably sophisticated code that turned out uh, you know, we're not really using anymore, but it had just sat there completely innocuous, not bothering anybody, and uh, it was... It had been written in this functional style where it was all self-contained. And you know, I count that as a win. And there's a number of things like that where you look at this and say, OK, this is a lot of complex, sophisticated code, but it's, it's a pure function. It's just completely compartmentalized over here. You pass in stuff, you get out stuff. And anybody that's not calling that function does not care whether that code exists or not. And that could be contrasted with so much other code that has assumptions and interactions and tendrils throughout the system where there are so many things that you, know, you, you set a flag here or you call this subsystem to put it into this state so that something else that you're going to do later will interact with that in a different way. And we have sort of the, the horror show of that right now is our build game code, the stuff that it goes and you say, you know, build game for these maps. It sets all of these hooks and flags throughout our resource loading and file system to sort of uh, be able to get callbacks on these different things and then runs and starts up the map and there's different flags and console variables and it's just god awful and it causes us problems on an almost weekly basis. And I've got enough of these positive cases to stack up against this to say it's, it's usually more of a pain to try and write something in this self-contained functional way, but, you know, but if you're going to use the code for years, it has large advantages. I just, I'm seeing the payoffs more and more as I, you know, just on a regular basis, I see these wins where that's been happy and good because it was written in a pure form. That's been a real pain because it wasn't, because it used callbacks and tendrils and flags and settings and all these other ways of doing things. So I am more convinced than ever that it really is a big win. So I've been applying this for years, just uh, the notion of functional purity in C++, you know, in my day-to-day -day writing language. And I've gone and poked around at, uh, you know, the, looked at Haskell in different places, but I never wrote a significant amount of code. Uh, in the last year, I set out to go ahead and try and get sort of my, you know, my 10,000 lines of code in real functional languages to try and get something that I can talk about their merits in a concrete sense rather than an abstract sense. And I had been 
you know, it was one of these things where I programmed just enough that I always had to go review the tutorials each time I did it. You know, I'd go through the beginning Haskell tutorials maybe three times where I'd go, I'd learn this, I'd write some code, come back six months later, forget all the ways to, to set up the imports, go through it again. But finally trying to write enough code to make it stick. And uh, the project that I set out to do on this was uh, I wanted to do something that would be enough code to be, to learn about the large systems because when you look through exercises in books, they're toys, and they're, they're a completely different set of things that you learn when you're looking at system scale versus exercise or toy scale. So it needed to be something with a little bit of meat on it and something that I could reference against uh, other things that I've done. So what I set out to do was take uh, the original Wolfenstein 3D and re-implement it in Haskell. So I started off with uh, you know, loading the, the assets into there, which are in this god-awful old format, back when I was fitting things on, on floppy disks and I was you know, reinventing compression methods for myself. So it's some RLE on top of very badly bastardized, independently invented LZSS uh, thing that's just you know, this messy binary format, which you'd think, OK, maybe this isn't the greatest thing for implementing functional purity. But it turned out that that winds up being a lovely little bit of functional code to do that, and it's, it's a fraction of the size of the C code, where you hear Haskellers and people talk about a tenth the size of equivalent code, and that's, that's probably an exaggeration, but I, you know, I believe that some of this nicely commented clean Haskell code can be uh, you know, a factor of a few smaller than the, the C++ code that, that I was porting to. Uh, I got to the point of having, uh, you know, having the guards on paths, walking around, uh, you know, running player movement at some basic levels. But I was finding that it's, it's really difficult for me to work on something that's not work. Uh, I, you know, I have this, you know, I would, I would pat myself on the back for tearing away and spending a whole hour on my Haskell research project every now and then. And I couldn't hit it on a regular basis. It was just not, I didn't have enough time to, I couldn't, I couldn't make myself take the time. I mean, I just have that internal itch that's like, oh, I could be doing something that's productive in the here and now. I and mean, I know that it's good in the long term, but it's a little, you know, it's a character issue that makes it difficult for me on that. So one of the things that happened then that was sort of a, a happy uh, you know, good fortune is I had, you know, I'd always been poking around. One of the languages that I would look at, I settled on Haskell as probably my, my functional language of choice to follow up on. And I, I generally still agree that that's one of the strongest uh, directions. I'm still not completely sold on the value of laziness. So the people that talk about ML derivatives, uh, they might have a point. I, I haven't evaluated side by side. So there, there may be something there. But one of the ones that I at least considered and rejected was Lisp. And Lisp has, you know, th there's a lot of history to Lisp. It's uh, just about the second oldest, uh, well, in use language. It goes back to the 50s. And I've always had in my head Lisp almost up on a pedestal. There were things like, uh, you know, a formative book in my teenage years was uh, uh, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, and a lot of that talked about the MIT uh, computer crowd, and you had the, you know, the building of the Lisp machines and the Lisp hackers and Richard Stallman's last days there, and that, you know, that stuck with me a lot, and there's things, reading Paul Graham's essays, reading the Unix haters handbook, and the uh, the people that, you know, that would still talk about these, these old list machines and the values of it. Oh, and the, my favorite paper title now is there was a, a paper by the, uh, the people that became the, the racket scheme uh, system, and the subtitle on it is Revenge of the Son of the Lisp Machine. It was about programming language environments, and I thought that was just, uh, just fabulous for a, a paper subtitle. Uh, so I'd always had this sort of lisp up on a, uh, a bit of a pedestal, and I thought, well, it'd be great to have deep Lisp knowledge. Because I've heard plenty of people say, oh, just learning the syntax, that's not going to do anything for you. You need to, to write enough code to sort of get the, the zen of Lisp. And for years, you know, for decades now, I've thought, well, that'd be nice, but you know, I'd pay money if I could get the brain download to do that, but I just can't see myself ever having the time to do that, as witnessed by my trying to spend time on Haskell. I just, I can't make myself spend that many. If I'm sitting at my workstation, I want to work on something that, you know, that's relevant to the current project. But uh, what happened is I found out that just poking around, I forget exactly how it came to my attention, but there's a tiny little Lisp development environment that you can get on the iPad called Lisping. And it's, it's this sort of visual editor. It matches up all your parentheses. And uh, you couldn't write a real program in it, but you can write Scheme in it. And 
uh, and go through and do exercises, and it shows you the, uh, the arrangements, and it's kind of neat. You, I look at that as, okay, this is, the idea of visual programming has never really taken off, and we all still wonder whether at some point we can extract more of the structure of the programs beyond just syntax coloring, and we can do useful things there. And Lisp, with its nature of everything is an S expression and the homoiconicity of it, has a lot going for it. And still, this is a trivial program, but what I found out that was just magical to me is that I have my iPad with me at like all of these times when I'm not at my workstation, and I found there were all of these little hours where I could be doing programming if it was on my iPad because I'm at home sitting in a, you know, on the couch somewhere, or I'm on an airplane, or I'm stuck someplace. I don't have my system, so I don't have that same personal guilt trip about not working on the work that, you know, that I need to move towards the next milestone, and I could actually do, you know, some real programming. So I, I, I picked up and I spent a, a decent amount of time learning Scheme, uh, doing some work uh, on the iPad, writing a few simple programs, write a KD tree uh, builder, write a parser for something. And eventually I did wind up with one of the, the grand old books of computer science, uh, you know, Structure and Interpre Interpretation of Computer uh, Programs, or SICP there, and that's, uh, you know, it's classic MIT text. It's for undergraduates. It's supposed to be sort of a first MIT course, but it uses Scheme as the programming language. And it's one of those books up on a pedestal that are on the books every computer programmer should read. And you know, I started going through, I, took, I actually took some time off from work and said, I'm going to do Lisp immersion. I'm going to spend uh, this week doing nothing but Lisp programming. Uh, I'm not even going to think about working on what I should be working on. And that worked. I was able to go in and clock a whole bunch of hours and you know, get to the point where I, I pretty much do get it, and I get some of the, the value from it. And the, uh, so this undergraduate book, you'd think, OK, why, why is John Carmack reading an undergraduate textbook on computer programming? Uh, but there's still, there's value to be gotten in, uh, you can find value in almost anything at that level. Any college textbook you pick up, you can probably get good value out of, even if it's a topic that you already know. One of the things that's, that I, I crossed some threshold in recent years where I've always loved sort of reading, grazing on technical stuff. I've always liked textbooks and reading them, I, you know, light bedtime reading for whatever. But in recent years, I've gotten to the point where I actually look forward to doing the exercises. And part of that's because getting older, you know, things, you need a little bit of an extra push to make things stick in your brain. And I was talking with my, my stepfather, who was an engineer, I, about that. I mentioned that, and he looks at me and says, he's, set, he's pushing 70. He's like, you have no idea, John. So I'm not sure I'm looking forward to the, you know, the slow decline towards that. But the, you know, working the exercises in the book uh, is, you know, is obviously useful. And the thing about uh, you know, this particular book, where if you take your uh, you know, learn language XXX in 24 hours, you just get these very practical little exercises. But here I'm going, I'm looking up, trawling through Wikipedia, going, OK, what's an Ackerman function? What are these church numerals? And all of this math basis stuff that was kind of entertaining to learn while I'm learning the programming challenges along with it. So, I do think that I sort of get Lisp now, and I have you know, a working ability in Haskell, and I've got a few conclusions coming from it. Uh, one of them is that there's still the, the question about static versus dynamic, and I know there was a survey just coming out recently where the majority of programmers are still really not behind static typing. And I know there's the, the two orthogonal axes about whether types are strong or weak and whether it's static or dynamic. And I come down really pretty firmly, and all of my experience continues to push me towards this way, that strong static typing has really significant benefits. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes you have to, to build up a type scaffolding to do something that should be really easy. But there are real strong wins to it. I see this in the code that causes us problems. In my, my toy stuff in recent months, seeing the... Uh, in, in the Haskell stuff that I was doing, the one head scratcher where I was looking at something going, what the heck is this doing? Why? And I, I desperately wanted a real debugger. And, you know, and Haskell does not have what I would consider a real debugger. The one thing that was there turned out to be the part of the data that was untyped when I was still looking at these two planes of data for the Wolfenstein data. And I just had them backwards, and it was causing bizarre stuff there. That was the only thing that really had me baffled for a little while was 
a case where proper typing would have removed that if it was dealing with typing throughout it. And conversely, in the Lisp work, I had a bunch of cases where I was doing something that was just wrong because the types weren't there. If it was statically typed, it would have caught it ahead of time. Now, I do see more of the charm now that I've had some experience with a dynamic language. I see the lure, the enticement of having just throw random types onto anything about not having to you know, have sort of template typing arrangements and things. You're, there's, a, there's an appeal to that, but I think that it bites you in the end if the code lives a long time and it grows enough. I think that the value of types is, is just super, super important. And that's something that's gonna, it's a religious argument among programmers. And I, I despair a little bit about trying to win the arguments in a, you know, in a convincing empirical sense, because these do come down to these tendencies of programmers. And if somebody's being uh, belligerent about it, they can just say, well, I don't have those tendencies. And I can say as, you know, being a, a lead programmer over, uh, or a technical director over dozens and dozens of programmers, millions of lines of code, it's just amazing how, you know, how many mistakes and how bad programmers can be. You know, everything that is syntactically legal that the compiler will accept will eventually wind up in your code base. And that's why I, I think that static typing is so valuable because it cuts down on what can kind of make it past those hurdles there. Uh, so I, I'm only getting stronger in my, you know, my stance on the utility of static typing, static analysis. I, you know, don't let those things just kind of happen and get fixed up at runtime. So one of my, uh, my sort of sneaky plan for turning the, the Haskell work on Wolfenstein into something that was going to tie into real work uh, relates to a vision that I have for using uh, multi-core and game logic in a different way than we're doing right now. So the state of where we're at right now with game code is that we run all the game code in one thread because the idea of using locks to synchronize amongst all of our current game code was just absolutely terrifying. Uh, the heavyweight lifting stuff that we do with collision detection, pathfinding, I, a lot of the, I, the, the stuff that would take up tons of work, building extra particles, uh, animating skeletons, all that gets run off into jobs that are done with deferred uh, calculations. It's, it's a pain to do things that way. You set it up, uh, but it's understandable, where a developer can just look at this and say, okay, I want to do this next frame. I'll set up my query. Please go trace these 50 things, and I'll deal with it next frame. It adds all these extra uh, flags and bookkeeping, but it's it's still a heck of a lot better than saying, oh, well, we're going to merrily run in parallel. I'm going to critical section some things. That way, it leads to disaster. There's just no way that was going to work out. But one of the things that I've been thinking might be possible is that the thing that I wanted to test on the Wolfenstein, and I didn't really get far enough on this to, to say for sure yet. I hope to follow up and, and continue it. And it's arguable that Wolfenstein's not enough to prove this one way or the other. But if you are running all of, your, all of your actors or your entities in the world independently parallel, but it's functionally pure, they're passed in a reference to a static copy of the world and themselves, they return their new version at the end. Uh, they can't break anybody else because they, just, they can't touch anything else. It's not allowed by the compiler. Uh, and that is, by the way, one of the things that I, I feel pretty strongly about why, why I went Haskell rather than something, uh, some of the other perhaps more approachable languages. It's the brutal purity of it. You know, languages talk about being multi-paradigm as if it's a good thing, but multi-paradigm means you can always do the bad thing if you feel you really need to. And programmers are extremely bad at doing sort of the time scale integration of the cost of doing something that they know is negative. I mean, everyone will know it's like, oh, this global flag, this is not a good thing. This is a bad thing, but it's only a little bad thing. And they don't think about how, you know, the, the next five years how many times that little bad thing is going to to affect things so brutal purity you have no choice you know you you do not have an escape hatch you cannot do set bang and change something just because you feel this is uh, you know this is a really good thing and it's appropriate here you just have no choice absolute purity um, and so yeah and the way I had that all segmented is the little bit of monadic code that happens in the main thread is just one file everything else is uh, absolutely pure functions no you know, not even any of the, you know, the fancy things that can help you escape in some ways. Uh, but so I was proving out this idea that, okay, entities running separately, you've got the, the, the obvious question, well, how do you shoot somebody if you can't affect them? I, you know, you, you say, well, I'm firing my gun, I, I hit him, the world says I do, uh, I want to make him die. So you have, to, you have to make an event of some kind that gets communicated to 
uh, to the other entity. And now all game engines have some kind of event passing mechanisms. And in general, I don't encourage people using them because it decouples the flow of control. You can do something. If you can do something right here, it's better to do it right here rather than have it done by some system elsewhere. But if you're in a pure functional mode, that's the only way you can wind up doing effects. And it turns out to actually be uh, not that bad. One of the things that was one of those, uh, wow, this is really clean in Haskell, is in Tech 5 and Tech 4, for that matter, we have an event system where you can bundle up objects with different numbers of parameters, and you've got issues with the typing and the number of parameters, and it's this whole system for, for passing around these bundled events. In Haskell, it's a partially evaluated function that just takes an entity as its parameter and returns another entity. There's no system for it. It's just built in for the language. You can have a, you know, a do damage function. You partially evaluate it with your five points of damage that you're going to do, and then you pass it so that it's just going to take that, uh, the last function parameter as the entity, and you set that up on your own personal list. So every entity makes a list of all of the things that they're going to do to anybody. And then at the beginning of the next frame, you go and you gather everything together. You find all of, you distribute all of that to the entities. The first thing they do, they've got the world, they've got the list of all the events that affect them from anybody else. They apply all of those, one after another, generating a new copy of themselves as they go. Then they do their thinking and their processing and generate the final version that goes back into the world. So there are, uh, with this sort of uh, method, there are, uh, coherence, nothing gets out of, because everything sort of happens at the same time. There's no sense of time ordering. But you do have the question of, since everybody's looking at the previous frame's rendering, two people approach a narrow hallway. They both say they want to go into that hallway. They both think it's clear, so they both go into it. And then, well, what do you do next frame? They both say, well, I'm, I'm here, but two people wound up at the same place. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, resolving that has to be done there. And it may just, and I haven't worked all of this out, but I'm completely, uh, completely satisfied that it's possible, that you, you wind up giving some precedence on there, you use physical repulsion rather than uh, absolute surface collisions on there. It can, it can all be worked out. So this was my, uh, my approach in Haskell. This is what I was building there, and it seemed to be working out well. Uh, it may yet fall apart on something you know, harder, but I had to pick uh, a research project that I could conceivably do, even if I haven't managed to, to finish it yet. If I had picked Doom 3, there's just no way I would have personally been able to go through and do this. Um, but my sneaky plan to justify all of this as actually being a really good idea was that while in C++, the idea of using everybody running the way the code is right now would, would not work. It would, be, it would be awfully crashing, and it would have race conditions, and it would just be terrible. But if you would code sort of in this style of you do your object from beginning to end, you could look at everybody else, but you can't touch anybody else, and you could do everything theoretically, all the stuff that we defer right now, the traces against the world, the animating your pose, the building your particles that tie on all that stuff, that as long as it didn't take more than six, one entire frame, 16 milliseconds, you could have straight line, pleasant, beautiful linear code uh, that would be clear and simple and easy to step through, tell what's going on, not this mess of deferred and handed off to different subsystems, queried the later frames. You could make code that would be nice again. It would be code that looks like, you know, Quake 1 through 3, where you're, you can just say, you start here, you go through, you do all of this, and you're done. That would be a really powerful thing for game development. If we could make game development twice as easy on the game programming side, we'd have twice the iteration time, get games done in half the time, it would be a huge, huge win to make some, it doesn't have to be an order of magnitude, but a factor of two would be monumental. Uh, so what my thought was is that, okay, we can't have things that just... Uh, that just randomly look around at all this, even if you say you're programming in this look-only way, but if your pointers let you point at somebody, again, if it's syntactically legal, it will make it into the code base. It would be almost impossible to, to guard against. So my scheme was, is instead of taking uh, just your sim single heap here, uh, go ahead and pretend you're doing gar I mean, actually do garbage collection on it, which another th is another thing that garbage collection is a benefit for developers. It has a bad name, a bad reputation in game development for intermittent pauses. Uh, intermittency is bad. A fixed overhead we can deal with, and it makes programming easier. And programming is often the long pole in the tent for getting, uh, getting games done. So anything we can do to make this easier to spend our performance is going to be a useful thing. So 
you set everything up, you garbage collect every frame, so you make a pass through all the objects in your game heap. It's going to take discipline to make sure that none of the big things stay in the game heap. You put all of your assets, resources separately managed, but the game stuff, you have it in the heap, you can make a walk through it every frame. So it's this a fairly standard com uh, sort of compacting or broken hearts uh, uh, garbage collection where you pass through, you copy over the stuff that you still need to the next frame. So you, it takes twice as much space for, uh, for your heap. But the game heap, if you isolate out all of the constant data and all of the big media, it's not that large. I, I can guarantee that our, our real mutable data, you could count it, it's counted in megs, not tens of megs. Uh, and it's probably only a few megs. So it's completely credible to walk it every frame. So you walk through the entire frame, you compact and copy it, garbage collect to another frame, but you keep the old frame there and you memory protect it. And when you're fixing up all of these pointers, you know, as you're doing the, the garbage collection, you're marking pointers on whether they're in use, whether you've copied them over, but each entity keeps its own pointers to itself, but any pointer that it, has to, that it has to something else points to the frame that was just memory protected, that was garbage collected from. So any pointer that you get is either going to point to your state, which is mutable, or if it's pointing to anything else, it's pointing to a static copy. So you will bus error if you try to access that. It will be hard protected. So it's not possible to sneak in something that's going to be a race condition. And I think that under those conditions, you get garbage collection, which is a programming win. You get the de-threading of all of these things that we do for performance reason. You allow it to run all of these things in parallel, so we get more scalability as we go up to dozens and dozens of cores. And I think it could be a really huge win, but it's a research project. It's not something that I can sort of roll into the, the current code base. But I look at it and think, it's not ridiculous that it could be migrated towards, and it would have some large benefits. So that's one of my you know, one of my sneaky schemes for wanting to kind of move the, the state of the programming forward there, but there's several things that need to happen in, uh, you know, before that can really kind of come to fruition. So some of the other things that, that are appealing about Lisp is, well, another, so related to programming the game stuff, I have been scratching my head a little bit in recent months thinking that when I look back at Quake 1, with I did Quake C, and that was me just totally winging it on language design. You know, okay, I've got C format expressions and one object type that goes across. That's the only thing you use for all of it. And it was certainly a huge success. There were lots of people that learned programming so they could do QC and, uh, and make mods for it. And it's had a positive impact on the way the industry's gone and people that have gone into it. But now I really do kind of wonder what would have been the divergent road if I had made, if it had been Quake Scheme instead of Quake C. Uh, because C Scheme as a the small version of Lisp is one of those things that the language is, it is extremely elegant and concise. And when you really sort of get that all you need is this parameter substitution in there and you can do everything from that, there's a, there's a majesty to that abstraction that's pretty powerful. And it has all the damn parentheses and it has prefix notation and these things that people, professional programmers that are used to working in C are not comfortable being shown a bunch of lists. There are, uh, there are arguments, I'm not sure, there are statements, I'm not sure that I believe them, that novice people that have never programmed before take as quickly to functional programming as declarative programming. That doesn't quite ring true to me. I, I think that might be some selection bias that maybe the MIT undergraduates that say they've never programmed do as well uh, when presented a functional programming language. But there is a lot to be said for the imperative nature of you explain computer programming by you do this, you do this. If this, you do this. Otherwise, you do that. And you know, from, you know, from teaching my seven-year-old and eight-year-old, I, I think that it's... I, I think that there is a value to the imperative nature there, but I do wonder if we had had a more potent language there, if we had used something like Scheme, what more could have been accomplished there that, that wasn't in the nature of just, uh, just Quake C. And so, you know, an idle thought where for embedding, for, for doing a big application, I think Haskell is just a superior language for what you'll get out of it than Lisp. There were lots of times I was doing Lisp code and I was thinking this would be shorter and clearer in, uh, in Haskell. Uh, and certainly the typing is, is a huge, huge thing. But for small things, for an embedded language like what Quake C was, there's a lot of advantage to Lisp is so, scheme at least, is so tiny. You can make, a, make it very, very small and yet still have 
kind of complete power. You know, you can in theory do anything with even the simplest of schemes there. So uh, using it for an embedded language is, is still appealing for me, and I've sort of still got my eye open for where, where could I use this in some way, because in the end, while I wouldn't do application development in it, I found it charming in a way that's sort of... I. Uh, maybe difficult to convey to uh, especially non-programmers, but it is this very, very old language that is still 